Heaven's angels all around My delight is found in knowing That you wear the victor's crown You're my help and my defender You're my savior and my friend By your grace I live to breathe and worship you song 
the heart of worship. And I simply come, come on church, longing just to bring something that's of worth, that will bless your heart. I'll bring you more than a song, for a song in itself is not what you have required. Search much deeper within Through the way things appear You're looking into my heart I'm coming back to the heart of worship And it's all about you It's all about you, Jesus I'm sorry, Lord, for the It's all about you, it's all about you, Jesus. King of endless world, no one could express how much you deserve.
This is going to be a slightly longer children's sermon because you guys are going to get front row seats and some of the friends that came up here are going to have something special happen today. But first off, you might be thinking, wait a second, Pastor Ryan, didn't you send a note to my family that said, make Miss Karen a birthday card? Where's Miss Karen? Well, Pastor Ryan did not know at the time that I sent that, that Miss Karen was planning to be able to go see Aiden in Iowa. So she got to celebrate her birthday today with her son who's going to school out in Iowa. But I will assure you, if you've made a card or a picture or anything like that, if you give it to us in the church office, we'll just put them all over the counter. Then when Miss Karen gets back, she'll go, whoa, look at all these people that said happy birthday to me. But there's another event happening today that's not Miss Karen's birthday that we celebrate. Do you know what we're celebrating today? Halloween. Ooh, it happens on Halloween. Oh, not a baptism. That's normally, that's the answer we normally have is we have a baptism. That's true. And I told you it was going to be longer. No, today is Reformation Sunday. And you're probably like, I've never heard of that. I don't know what that is. Right? Or maybe some of you have heard of that. But it did happen on Halloween that this guy named Martin Luther went to the church door and he nailed something on the church door. Isn't that a little silly? Just right on the church door, just posted it. And he said, church, I think this is where we can do better. Here's 95 ways. Probably a little bit of a long list, but he really cared about the church and wanted to see the church live in a way that reflected God's kingdom in a positive way where people would get to experience God through that. And here's one of the things that was happening. In the church, the Bibles were written in a language. How many of you know Latin? Is that a common language that you guys know? Latin. How many of you know Latin? Any of you? No? How many of you know, how many of you know English? Oh, a lot more of you. You know, some of you are learning to read, right? And so what they wanted to do is they said, church, we want you to have a Bible in a language that you can read. That's one of the things the Reformers did. And so today, when we're celebrating Reformation Sunday, we want to give out Bibles. And as I was thinking about it, this is what's special about this. How many of you have ever been to the library and taken out a book? Probably a lot of you, right? What has to happen with that book? What do you have to do with that book after a certain length of time? Yeah, what do you have to do? you got to bring it back to the library, right? You don't get to keep that book. Are you allowed to, like, take a pen and underline something in that book? No, please don't do that to your library books. But if you go to a book fair, what do you get to do? Buy a book. And whose book is that? It's your book. You get to take it home. You could also underline in some of those books, but your parents might not want you to do that either. But today... We're going to have some second graders, and they're going to be given a Bible. And this isn't like the library. We don't want the Bible back. We want you to take it home like the book fair books and read it and maybe underline in it or highlight it. It's your 
Bible. And so I thought, this is a cool thing. So this is the Bible that I actually got in third grade. And so it's got a little note in the beginning of it. And then at summer's best two weeks, I got to make this cover thing that says I'm third and that sort of stuff, right? And then later, I got this Bible. And this Bible was given to me when I was a senior and I was graduating. If you look in this Bible, I did underline a bunch in that sort of stuff, okay? I didn't so much in this one. <laughs> and then when I got ordained to be a pastor, my grandmother gave me this one, right? And I've got some other Bibles back in my office, but this was not going to be a show all of Ryan's Bibles. But the reality is today is a special day for our second graders and for our sixth graders because they're going to get Bibles. And so you get to be right up here and you get to witness this happening. Now, for our second graders, we actually are going to bring up the second graders and their parents to present the Bibles to them. And then after that, we'll have the sixth graders come up uh, to get their Bibles. And so any of our second graders and parents, you can come forward right now. Okay, so uh, what you're going to be able to do right now, parents, um, you can uh, share what you wrote in the Bibles, and I'm going to tell people about the class that you guys are getting to go to. So spend some time right now handing the Bible and letting them see that. Uh, so what's going to happen, and it's a really special thing that Karen does with the second graders, is last week uh, she talked to the parents and they got these Bibles and they've gotten to write some stuff in it to their kids. And then they get them today in worship. And then for the next three weeks, they're going to be learning about their Bibles, like how do you find the different things in the Bible? What are some of the different books of the Bible? And the parents are going to be there. So it's this beautiful class that we've done where... The kids and the parents get to dig into this first Bible and understand uh, what it can be to read it and what it means to really take in some of the scripture and apply it to their life. Um, all right, so I'm going to let them finish up, but, I, but stay, stay up here because I want to bring the sixth graders up and then we're going to do a big prayer for everyone. Um, so if you are in sixth grade and uh, you should be getting a Bible, come on up now. All right, uh, the sixth graders... So what happens is we give them this Bible in second grade, and it's great for a second grader. But as they get into sixth grade and they're entering into the youth group years, you know, you need a different Bible. And so we're giving them this teen study Bible, and this teen study Bible is what you're going to really use a ton in confirmation class when we do it. But you get to have it for two years before confirmation class uh, where it's yours. You can mark it, make it your own. Uh, it asks different questions in there. It has different charts. It's it's more age appropriate than the, the second grade Bibles for you. So I encourage you, dig in, get to know these Bibles. But let's say a whole big prayer for our second graders and for our sixth graders. And because it's the children's time, this is going to be a repeat after me prayer. So everyone can join in if you want to. Let's bow our heads. Dear God, thank you for giving us your word in the Bible. Please help these second graders and these sixth graders and all of us to learn what you've said and to put it into action. In Jesus' name, amen. So let us now draw our attention to God's truth as captured in Matthew, and uh, we'll be looking at the 16th chapter of Matthew and hear God's word for us on this particular day, which is Reformation Day. I'll read it from the screen. When Jesus came to the region of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, who do people say the Son of Man is? And they replied, some say John the Baptist. Others say Elijah. And still others, Jeremiah or one of the prophets. But what about you, he asked. Who do you say that I am? And Simon Peter answered, you are the Messiah, the, the son of the living God. And Jesus replied, blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, 
For this was not revealed to you by flesh and blood, but by my Father in heaven. And I tell you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not overcome it. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Then he ordered his disciples not to tell anyone that he was the Messiah. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God, my friends. Let us be in a time of prayer. Oh, Lord God Almighty, truly it is a great thing for us to gather as the faithful disciples who long to encounter your truth on this particular Sunday that we recognize as Reformation Sunday. A time of reformation and resurgence, a time of recognition that we need to realign ourselves to be able to recognize that it's sola scriptura, only your truth. So Lord, guide us even now as we encounter this, your holy word. That the words of my mouth and the meditations upon our hearts will be made acceptable in your sight. For you alone are our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Well, a quick review here, my friends, as we uh, get ourselves geared up and recognizing where we are and what's been happening around here. You know, we've done this whole series on theodicy, and we started out by looking at nature, and, and then we stepped down into the next part of politics, right, and economics in the marketplace. And, and what is that aspect that we recognize as nations and borders and, and then family and education? It only seems appropriate that we end this series on this particular day in the life of the church that we talk about, the church. And if God is sovereign and loving and good, then why is the church so dang messed up? Hmm. Yeah. So here we are with the children's message. And what are we recognizing today? Well, of course, as we think about it, as we drive through our neighborhoods, what is it that October 31st is all about, let alone the year 1517? But October 31st is all about Halloween. That's what we recognize. That's what we like to celebrate. That's fascinating because we get all dressed up, put on our costumes, go to our parties, have our times a little shindig, trick-or-treat, watch our holiday specials, and who can't resist, right? Who can't resist to turn on? It's the great pumpkin, Charlie Brown. Everybody loves that show. I mean, there it is. You got Linus and Lucy in the pumpkin patch with Snoopy snuffling around, waiting on the great pumpkin. You got Charlie Brown and all the other kids. And Charlie Brown being the apex character representing all the suffering. Yeah, poor schmo. I mean, and here we are at the end of this series on suffering in relation to the theodicy question, if God is in control. But I got to thinking about all that with Halloween and costumes. And what it was that Luther was doing on that particular day. He wasn't thinking about costumes. He wasn't even thinking about Halloween, really. But he was thinking about the church and how the church had put on a costume, had a facade. So in 1517 of October 31st, he nailed his 95 theses on the Wittenberg church door. And I started thinking some more about that. I'm thinking about the church and the facade that it has. You know, this past summer, Caleb and I were cycling through Europe, and 
we saw a lot of cathedrals. And we stopped in on a lot of cathedrals. And I'm telling you what, yeah, they're gorgeous. No question. I mean, you look at these magnificent structures, the facade of these churches, and you go, wow. And people are flowing in and out with their cameras and notebooks and sketchbooks and all this, and they're all commenting, oh my gosh, look at this architecture. Look at the artwork of that stained glass. Look at this mural. You know, they're all agog and, and just mesmerized by the splendor. And we know from historical record, the part of the rationale for why those things are built during the medieval period and in some period later, you know, is try to capture the magnificence of God, the splendor of who God is in a building. Huh. But they were all dead. Yeah, they look great. You know, even the disciples got caught up in the thing. Right? We read about it in the Bible where the disciples are going up to Jesus. They're like, Jesus, man, check this building out. I mean, it is fantastic. You see the architecture of this building, how they built that and did this and all this jazz. You're like, oh my gosh, this is phenomenal. Look what man's able to do. Yeah, it's a monument, huh? To man's ingenuity. Hmm. And Jesus says to his disciples, you know, boys, not one stone is going to be on top of another. This is all coming down. Wow. That kind of let the air out of the balloon. But then again, I started thinking some more. It's a dangerous thing. So I'm in the saddle and riding along, and even as I'm putting this message together on this particular day, and I thought, what's the facade of the 21st century church? Maybe we're not building these big sandstone buildings, granite buildings. But maybe we're building something else. Putting up a facade that, hey, look at this. But all the while, it's dead inside. I thought about it. I said, you know what? I think... Yeah, 21st century church. We got this facade of wanting to have a McDonald's church. That's what we want. Yeah, something where we can come in, check out, get what we want and leave. You know, or is that like uh, maybe a Burger King church? Have it your way. You know, this is what we want. Even during COVID, we had what? A drive-through church. Just give it to me fast. I'm out of here. I don't have time for this. I got to move. I got things to do. I want to have my meal just put in a bag. You want fries with that church? Sure. Or maybe the 21st century church is more along the lines of Disney, right? Oh, yeah, there we go. That's what we want. We want a Disney church. Just let me come to church and be entertained. See all the smoke and the machines and all the cool dynamics and animatronics that can happen in church. Let's see what's happening here with the programmatic stuff that's all there. Oh, entertain me, church. That's what we want. Hmm. Yeah. Seems to be the case. But you may be sitting there going, Ted, that's so passe. You know, it's all about your internet presence, Ted. The church, what's your footprint on the internet? Talk to me about your Instagram feed. What's going on with Facebook? How are you getting that social media thing going for your church? I can't tell you how many times I get an email from somebody telling me we can make your internet presence a little bit more vibrant. Thank you, but no thanks. What does this mean? When we put a huge value upon that frontispiece, that facade, we're not really attending to that which really matters. Or maybe, just maybe, in the 21st century church, no different than the medieval church. We're trying to make ourselves an empire. We want this big, awesome piece that we can plant out in the neighborhood somewhere, multi-campus, 
all this stuff that we can do. Yes, just like Pope Leo and his things that he had to try and create and underwrite this massive project of building the Vatican. Yeah, that's what we want. And it was Luther that stripped it all down. He said, this is a masquerade. It's dead. There's death in the church. Where is the vibrancy? Your mick church that you want is going to give you cholesterol. That's no good. The entertaining church that you desire in the 21st century is so shallow you're going to come away feeling like God has abandoned you. That internet church that you're hoping for is so disconnected from what it is to really be engaged in a vital relationship that it calls upon you to be vulnerable doesn't exist. And the Empire Church is all about self. And Luther was stripping it down to the core. Let's take that costume off, my friend. And so what's Jesus do? <laughs> it's amazing. So Jesus takes his 12 disciples. And he says, hey, we're going on a field trip. Now, everybody loves field trips. I don't know one kid or even one adult that doesn't like a field trip. You get to get on the school bus, you trundle on down to wherever, then you get out and you mess around. And you're like, oh, man, this is so cool. Well, Jesus takes his disciples on a field trip up from Caesarea. Now, Caesarea is on the, it's right there on the northern shore of Sea Galilee, and so it wasn't a real long field trip. You know, it was just a short bus ride up the shores of the uh, Jordan River or the source waters to the Sea of Galilee and those source waters coming out of Mount Hermon. Well, what do you know? At the base of Mount Hermon was this place where the king of the northern kingdom of Israel at the time of the split said, you know what? I'm not sending the people down to Jerusalem. We're going to set up our own place to worship up here. And it was so perverted, so off base, it was worshiping the gods of Bashan. Bad news. Human sacrifice. Firstborn children thrown into the gates of hell that Jesus talks about. You see, Guiana, up in Caesarea Philippi, as we now know it, there's a place there, you can still see it today, where there's a hole in the side of the mountain. And there, people would throw people as a sacrifice. It's there that they would dress up as half goat, half man, and slaughter things. It was a place of death, an absolute, sinister, diabolic worship. You know, everything under the sun that you can think about that is repulsive to God was taking place at that place. If you've seen the TV series The Chosen, they do a very fabulous job of depicting what that might have been like. And the reaction by the disciples on this particular field trip, <laughs> heading up to where Pan is worshipped where we get the idea of panic because the whole worship was built around fear and anxiety. Keep you in order, right? Whew. Scary stuff. Very scary stuff. And Jesus takes his disciples up there. This is what I love about Jesus. He's always in the business of redeeming really bad things giving him a new name, a new place, a new identity. And that's what he does with that part of the northern portion of Israel because there it is, planted right in the northern reaches of Israel, which was supposed to be a nation set apart to honor and worship God. But they allowed this perversion to come in and spread like a poison throughout the whole land. And Jesus says, I'm coming up here and we're redeeming this place. And the disciples were scared to death that they were up there. 
And there they were, Jesus standing right at the headwaters of where the Jordan River flows down. It brings life into the Sea of Galilee and spills out life through the rest of that portion of the land into the Dead Sea. Hmm, maybe that was the thing. And Jesus asked the question, sort of like Luther in some ways. He's stripping off the costumes. He asked the question, you know, who do people say that a son of man is? And so they started talking about these different costumes. Well, he's John the Baptist. I don't know. He's, he's, he's Elijah, man. No, 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 no. no. He's, he's like Jeremiah. And then they throw out a catch-all. Well, he's like one of the prophets. <laughs> throw them all out there. And it makes me wonder. What kind of costume are we putting on Jesus? Who are we making him out to be? Are we going into the closet and pulling down that one costume that he can put on? It's called friend. He's just my good buddy. Are we going down to Joanne Fabrics and pulling out the, the little templates that they have there? So you can sew up a costume for Jesus and one that kind of looks like great moral teacher, right? Is that how we see Jesus? Or do we see Jesus as, oh, no, 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 wait a minute, wait a minute. We see Jesus as, well, he's just one of many that get us to go to heaven. Yeah, that's a popular one. Everybody likes that one. Yeah, I like Jesus because he, you know, he's one of many that you can get to heaven. One of the prophets. And so I ask you, even as Jesus asked his disciples, who do you say that he is? And I think there was a strange silence when Jesus asked that question to those disciples up there at Caesarea Philippi. Where in the background they're seeing the priests slaughtering goats. Or in the background they're seeing moms throwing babies into the pit. Celebrating death more than life. And Peter eventually breaks the silence and he says, well, you're the son of the living God, the Messiah. Can you say that? What does that mean to recognize Jesus as Lord? as son of the living God. What does that mean that he's not just a friend? That he's not just a good moral teacher? That he's not just some other wise guy that helps us find our way through life? What does it mean for us to make that declaration? Because we're not capable of making that declaration in and of ourselves. And Jesus recognizes that with Peter. He even tells Peter, he says, Simon Barjona, blessed are you because flesh and blood did not allow you to make you to say this, even as he's watching flesh and blood being spilt and stabbed behind him. It wasn't by human manipulation. It wasn't by human declaration and power of will. Jesus goes on and says, the Son of God, the Holy Heavenly Father, right? That's what he said. Let me get it perfectly straight for you here. He says, he says Blessed are you, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. And so likewise for us, it's God Almighty who gives us the capacity to be able to declare Jesus is Lord. On this Reformation Day, what do we need to do to ourselves? 
to reform our thinking, to reshape how it is that we approach Jesus and our, even our attitude toward coming before the presence of a holy God to express his lordship in worship. That is our primary purpose. What is it that we worship and adore? Do we truly worship and adore Jesus as Messiah? Or is he just a convenience? Or someone who entertains us? Or someone who gives me a little bit of authority and power to manipulate others? Hmm. Wow. And so Jesus looks at Peter and says, you, Simon Barjona, are called Peter, Petros. And upon this rock, I will build my church. Upon this declaration, right, that you are the Messiah, that declaration of faith and acknowledgement of his lordship will be the church built right there on that. It becomes our cornerstone. Isn't that what we see when we go back into the Old Testament? Even our Old Testament lesson here, which is really kind of good. We look at Isaiah chapter 51, and it's so dang good because the reality is, is right there. Jesus is looking at Peter, and he's saying, yes, this is exactly what it is. And it's a pursuit of wanting to live right before God. That pursuit of righteousness, because this is what Jesus tells his disciples right at the very beginning when he's teaching them in the Sermon on the Mount. He says, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. Poof, yes, I need to be in the presence of God. I want to study his word. Then we get to Isaiah 51, and we see there are 52, right, 51, excuse me, and we see right here what it is that Isaiah captures as our own heart's desire. It says, listen to me, says God. You who pursue righteousness, this is our heart's desire. You who seek the Lord. And again, Jesus goes on in that Sermon on the Mount, and he says to the disciples, he said, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. This is our primary goal. Why? And we get into the rest of 51, and we see, look to the rock from which you have been hewn. You haven't been carved out of the foothills of, the, of Mount Hermon and turned into a stone pillar and turned into some idol. You've been hewn out of the living God who called you into existence. This is the rock that you have. And it's become the foundation. And he says, look, and he goes on, he says, look to Abraham, your father, and to Sarah who bore you. You know, too often our own Christianity is built upon our own self-interpretation of what it is that we want from Jesus. And here the Lord is saying, do you really know who your patriarchs are? Do you know your matriarchs? Have you studied them? Have you looked into their lives? Because when you look into their lives, you see the fulfillment of God's promise at work through them. And they're giving you the capacity to think clearly about what it is that you may have as a question regarding theology or even in your own walk and discipleship. You'll learn from those who have gone on before you. We do not walk this walk alone. The church triumphant is before us. And are we accessing them? Are we recognizing the power that is there. Because in the midst of that, you're building your own historical narrative of God's promises being fulfilled in your own life as you live in that act of faith, as you live into the promises and them being fulfilled. And Isaiah goes on at the very end in verse 6 of our Old Testament lesson. He says, you know, lift up your eyes to the heavens. Go ahead. Look at the earth beneath. Do that as well. For the heavens vanish like a smoke. And the earth will wear out like a garment, and they who dwell in it will die in like manner. In other words, the things that you put your trust in, these things of earth, you see this great temple, Jesus says to his disciples? Gonzo. But my salvation will be forever, and my righteousness will never be dismayed. This is where our trust resides, my friends. This is where we place our hope. This is where our identity is. Strip away the costume. Pull away the mask. 
take down the facade and get back to the foundational component of what is our life of faith before Jesus Christ? Are we building upon the cornerstone? For even as Jesus concluded his Sermon on the Mount, he said, you know what? Be the man who built his house on a rock, not the one who built it on the shaky sands. The cornerstone has been set. The main rock is set there before you for you to have a solid foundation in which to live. This is what we do. This is what Jesus is calling us to do. This is how we live. Hmm. Right now, we have this great adult class that's going on. And uh, it's called Emotionally Healthy Spirituality with Peter Scazzaro. Maybe you've been thinking, I ought to tap into that class. Well, you can tonight. Come on out. It's a great class, honestly. Scratch everything. Come on out. Well, anyway, in this book, Peter references one of his members and a quote that they gave him. His name is Jay. Maybe it's Jay. Maybe it's Frank. Who knows? It's Jay for the book. And so Jay says to Peter, he says, you know, I've been a Christian for 22 years. He says, you would think that I'd be a 22-year-old Christian. <laughs> he says, I've come to realize I'm just a one-year-old Christian 22 times over. I come to realize a lot of us are still putting on costumes. I come to realize that as we go about our Christian, Christianity, a lot of us don't have the maturity of a 22-year-old. We're still drinking milk, as Paul would write. We should be eating solid food. We should be digging deep and knowing some of the theological truths that are here and how to defend them, how to speak of them, how to engage others in society and culture with the, with the beauty of the gospel. But we come here as dependent little infants. Feed me, feed me, care for me, carry me. Toddling around, tripping over ourselves. And afraid to take leadership. Because we're just little babies. Still one years old. It's a sad thing when our world is beat up and we wonder why the church is so messed up. It's because the church hasn't grown up. And it's dead inside. Can we make that declaration like Peter did? And are we capable to strip off the costume, the facade, I start thinking about that Halloween special and there's Charlie Brown putzing around with his goofy ghost outfit on. And he goes door to door and he reaches into the bag and a lot of us may feel like life's really beat me up from all those different spheres, whether from a natural disaster or economic situation or whatever it would be, I my family of origin, the education that's been not afforded to me, whatever it could be, you know, all the ways that we mentioned how suffering has taken place and how the church has dropped the ball in addressing some of those broken places. We've talked about all that. And you may feel like Charlie Brown, the apex of suffering. Nobody knows the sorrow that I've known. Hmm. But I'm going to tell you, you reach into your Halloween bag of tricks you're going to pull out that rock and you're not going to talk about it disparagingly because when you pull out that rock as the psalmist writes some 13 times in 13 different psalms God is a rock and that's what you got I got a rock oh yeah I forgot about my slides thanks Matthew Let's do that as a quick review. Fly through these bad boys so you can see some of these facades. There's one of them. Get the, hit the next one. There's another one. 
There's, oh, man, look at the inside of those ones. Wow. Click to another one. Oh, yeah, of course, the Grand Dame of Paris. And there we are at the end of the Camino. Oof. Yeah, that place was magnificent. Supposedly, James Bones are in there. But here's the one you need to remember. Well, there's Caesarea Philippi. That's what it looks like. Kind of crazy, isn't it? Over to the left, that big hole. That's the gates of hell right there. Hmm. Fascinating. Next one. And then go one more. There you go. Remember that, my friend. Let's do some praying. Lord, you are amazing. And we thank you that you've given us the life to live and a time to celebrate it. And even as we examine ourselves on this Reformation Sunday, we realize that we're going to celebrate what it is that you're doing in the lives of those around us, and particularly us, ourselves, personally. So guide us to be able to make that good confession that you are the Lord, the Messiah, the Son of the living God. It's in your name we pray. Amen. As we say, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Woke up this morning, saw a world full of trouble, now thought, how'd we ever get so far down? How'd we ever gonna turn around? So I turned my eyes to heaven, I thought, God, why don't you do something? Well, I just couldn't bear the thought of people living in poverty, children sold into slavery. The thought disgusted me, so I shook my fist at heaven, said, God, why don't you do something? He said, I did. I created you If not us then who If not me and you Right now It's time for us to do something If not now Time for us to do something. So tired of talking about how we are God's hands and feet. To the say to be to live like angels of apathy. Who tell ourselves it's all right. Someone else will do something. I want a fire I want to be the one who stands up and says I'm going to do something If not us then who If not me and you Right now It's time for us to do something Yes it is Come on If not now for us to do something We are sort of the earth We are city on a hill We're never gonna change the world by standing still If 
not me and you right now it's time for us to do something if not now then when will we see an end of all this pain it's not enough to do time for us to do something it's time for us to do something time for us to do something oh friends we go <laughs> we go from this place and as we come to an end of this series we're going to bring an end to our ironic blessing to one another. So again, it's up here on the screen. Turn and face one another. Hopefully you were praying for the face that you saw last week. And again, I invite you to peel out a face from the opposite side. Pray for that person's face and the rest of their body. But uh, you want to pray for that person, whether you know them by name or not. And we're going to share this blessing now. Go ahead, north side. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you. And grant you peace. Friends, go forth from this place knowing that you are well loved, that you have been enveloped into the arms of a Savior who's called you into existence, a living God. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost, the people of God say, Amen. I'm fighting the